My name is Francis Fukuyama. I'd like to welcome you to the second uh, of our two Night Owl sessions uh, that's sponsored uh, jointly by the center that I direct, the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Stanford University and the EPRC uh, with uh, some very generous help from the uh, embassies of Britain and uh, the United States. Uh, and the topic of our discussion tonight is defending common values, uh, strategic partnerships. Uh, and I think that this is actually an extremely uh, important topic. Um, maybe I could just say before introducing the other panelists a little bit about uh, where I see the, the struggle of values, uh, because there is a big one. There was one during the Cold War, and there's one going on right now. Uh, and it's a very, um, uh, it's a very troubling uh, period, I think, that we are living through. From the 1970s until uh, approximately the mid-2000s, uh, we were experiencing what Samuel Huntington, my mentor, uh, the political scientist at Harvard University called the third wave of democratization when the number of electoral democracies in the world increased from about, about 35 to 40 to about 115 around the world. But that process uh, came to a halt uh, in about 2005. Uh, for the last nine or 10 years, we've seen what my colleague Larry Diamond uh, has labeled the democratic recession. Uh, it's not just that in the aggregate, the number of democracies has been falling, uh, but it's also, there's something different in the air. Uh, authoritarian countries uh, are much more self-confident. They're much more organized uh, and they've got a plan. Uh, for example, uh, many authoritarian countries have passed very restrictive laws uh, clamping down on civil society, uh, particularly civil society that receives funding from the outside, but uh, it includes uh, very innocuous kinds of organizations uh, that simply want to do good things you know, within their society. This has gone on in Venezuela, in Egypt, in Iran, in Russia, uh, in any number of countries uh, around the world. Uh, and they all imitate each other. They all learn from each other. They've learned to uh, restrict um, information and the flow of information, not just on the traditional media like uh, radio and television, but they're mastering the internet and using it, uh, I think, for their own uh, purposes. And I think that in a certain way, the democratic world uh, has been a little bit fat and happy, you know, in this period of the third wave. Uh, there's not been a strong perception uh, as there was during the Cold War that there is this, uh, there's a growing threat to freedom around the world. And I think that there hasn't been anything like the organized response uh, that uh, existed in, uh, in earlier decades. And I think that that's a big mistake uh, because I think that foreign policy, uh, a country's foreign policy has to be based on uh, a mixture of interests and values. No country can disregard uh, uh, national interest, but I think that a country that does not operate within uh, a framework of basic values uh, also is gonna lose its way uh, in the world. And if you look at who, um, who is allied to who or who supports uh, whom, uh, it's clear that values play an important uh, role in that. And I think that this is obviously the case uh, with Georgia, uh, that Georgia has been uh, one of the most uh, successful. Now, I understand from within the country, you know, and, and this is true of my country as well, the United States, democracy doesn't look all that good. Uh, we're going through a really very strange primary season in the United States, and I can't say that as an American, I'm really proud of our democratic process right now. And so this is true, I think, of every, uh, uh, you know, of every democratic country, that it's like making sausages where the actual uh, details are, are sometimes not that uh, appetizing. But it's, uh, it's still important, uh, I think, that we do share these basic values. I think that 
Georgia is in a very exposed strategic position. Uh, a good deal of its territory is occupied by a certain large country neighboring, neighboring uh, country. And I think that without that external support, uh, it would be very hard to maintain uh, democracy uh, in a place like Georgia. Uh, so that's the purpose of the panel, is to talk about this interplay of uh, interests and uh, values in um, the relations of, of Georgia with its uh, external neighbors. And we have a, a number of panelists that represent, uh, I think, different uh, aspects or different views of uh, the friends of Georgia around the world. So let me just uh, introduce let me just introduce them. So I guess I'll just go uh, from uh, left to right. Uh, so on my immediate uh, right is uh, uh, Ambassador Alexandra Hall Hall, who is the ambassador of uh, Great Britain to uh, Georgia. Uh, following her uh, is Mr. Nicholas Berliner, who's the deputy chief of mission of the uh, uh, Embassy of the United States of America. Uh, following uh, him is uh, David Kramer, who is a senior director for human rights and democracy at the McCain Institute for International uh, Leadership. Uh, after David is my colleague, Catherine Stoner, who is a senior fellow and director of the uh, Ford Dorsey Program in International Policy Studies at my center, uh, CDDRL, uh, followed by my colleague in our Leadership Academy for Development Program, uh, Professor uh, uh, Alan Traeger, who uh, is a uh, director of the uh, uh, program on public-private partnerships at the Johns Hopkins School uh, of Advanced International Studies. And so I guess maybe we should just go in the same order. We'll all speak um, uh, on this general topic of, of values and partnership. Uh, and then we'll throw the uh, discussion open to, um, to the audience. So Ambassador Hall Hall. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, and thank you to Stanford and EPRC for organizing this event. I wasn't expecting to go first. I was expecting to have a few chances to reconfigure my thoughts, So, um, but you've put me in the firing line. Um, the last time I spoke at an event organized by EPRC, I got more publicity than I'd dreamt of in several years, um, which, uh, which was great fun, actually, and I vowed to myself to do it a bit more often. Um, but I may be a little bit more, I, I might start with a few safer and duller remarks at first, and you can see if you can tease me out during questions. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the UK-Georgia partnership and why um, uh, we think this relationship matters and what we think we've achieved through that partnership. Um, <clears throat> the, um, I would say that uh, um, for many years, um, in fact going back over 100 years, um, the UK and Georgia have had a very strong friendship. Um, we've had a very strong relationship and we have cooperated in a lot of fields, but I wouldn't have said it was a strategic partnership. Um, for a start, our interactions were very ad hoc. Um, I would I and my predecessors would desperately write pleading letters to uh, our ministers in London, begging one of them to come and visit. And every so often, like a London bus, one would show up. Um, but, uh, you know, it rather depended on their diary and what other crises were going on in the world. So it was ad hoc, but it wasn't um, strategic in a planned, measured, consistent way. Um, and when you have interactions that are rather random like that, it means that uh, you come uh, to that meeting with whatever is on the top of your mind um, at that current week or whatever is the current controversy of the day. And so, again, the discussions, they were always very friendly and they were usually pretty frank, but we weren't really getting to the heart of the issues and thinking in a more strategic way. And I also think um, that what I thought when I first got here and um, started learning more and more about what uh, uh, my embassy with its very talented staff were doing, um, we were so active on such a wide range of issues. 
Um, but it was always the Americans who were getting the credit for the us Georgia <laughs> strategic dialogue and partnership. And I was like, hang on a minute, we may be a much smaller embassy, but in terms of quality, we're actually there. <laughs> and we're doing quite a lot of good things, um, but we're not getting the same recognition. Um, and also, a lot of what we were doing, people don't always understand because it doesn't always happen here. It happens in Brussels or it happens in New York or it happens in Vienna where we're very active in support of Georgia. But people here don't always see that. So, um, and that recognition, it's not just so I can tweak my American friend's tail. Um, <laughs> But it's also because the Georgian people, especially now in this time when there is this sort of counter-propaganda and this sense that is the West really here for us, it's really important that people in Georgia know the West is here for you. We are here and we are active and we are doing a lot of things. And there's more than just the EU and NATO, there's the individual countries that belong to those organizations. So um, raising awareness of what we're doing is actually substantively important as well. And uh, no one in the UK has ever been in any doubt that Georgia's success matters, your geographical location, your example to the region, and above all, in light of what's been happening in the last few years, it's really important to us that Georgia succeeds. So... Um, a couple of years ago, uh, I and my team in the embassy sort of thought about what can we do to take this friendship and partnership to a new level. And we decided to set up a new uh, formal dialogue, which we called the Wardrop Dialogue, in honour of the first British commissioner to the Transcaucasus 100 years ago. And we chose that name to symbolize that this is an enduring uh, friendship. It's not just a flash in the pan. It's something that uh, existed 100 years ago and we want to continue. Um, and it involves one formal round a year and one interim round. It's at ministerial level. Um, it allows us to engage uh, people from uh, ministries across Georgia, meeting with their counterparts in the UK. I will confess, I um, looked up how you did it in Washington and came up with three working groups, <laughs> not entirely dissimilar to yours. Um, uh, there's a bilateral and sort of political working group where we talk about the state of the bilateral relationship and also uh, some of the sort of political issues um, going on in each country. Um, there's a defense and security one, uh, we, do, we have um, advisors permanently embedded in the Georgian Ministry of Defense. Uh, we are very active in support of Georgia within NATO, and we also have been running for many years, a lot of you will know, a program to develop Georgia's national security architecture. And then a third working group on economy and trade. Um, <clears throat> uh, what's it achieved? I think in some ways it's consolidated what we already knew, um, it, we, some of the issues have touched on familiar ground, EU, NATO, sharing analyses of what's going on in the region, Ukraine, Russia. It's also involved quite a lot of reassurance um, uh, with our Georgian friends that we, we really do think of Georgia in its own right, not just as an add-on to wider regional problems. We care about your country individually. Um, it's allowed us to touch on some sensitive uh, domestic issues in a way that hasn't been misunderstood um, because we've asked a lot of questions. It hasn't been a one-way finger-wagging exercise. It's been a real dialogue. Um, and it's exposed a lot of new areas for cooperation, um, helping Georgia develop its strategic communications. We have a formal human rights dialogue. Um, we, in the most recent round, we agreed we needed to cooperate uh, much more deeply on counter-terrorism uh, and organized crime. And it's not dominated by uh, whatever is the issue of the day. So um, I genuinely think we've moved from a friendship to a partnership. I genuinely think it's strategic. Um, and I think it's allowing us to target our engagement here in a far more effective way. So Good. over to you, Nicholas. Thank Top you. That. Okay. Thank you very <laughs> much. That's it. <laughs> That's, a, that's a going to be a tall order, but I'll, I'll try. <laughs> um, and first of all, it's a real honor to be here with such a great, uh, great panel. And from the U.S. perspective, we were, uh, we've been looking recently 
um, at you know how do we sort of keep the keep the profile um, here and. Uh, one thing that's coming up, of course, is that this is 25 years, 25 years since Georgia regained its independence, and then soon uh, 25 years since we established diplomatic relations uh, with an independent Georgia after the fall of the Soviet Union. And I think all of you know uh, that U.S. policy from the very beginning, when, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, was very much focused on helping to support uh, and develop both the independence and the sovereignty of the states uh, that emerged from the Soviet Union. And of course, with all of its, you know, all of its components, the economic assistance, but also importantly, uh, governance assistance, and with a focus on on democracy, which has been a common, a common theme of our foreign policy now for many years. Um, I, I don't think it it'd be any shock if I say that obviously the results of those uh, of those efforts at democracy. Um, are, are very different uh, across that space. And in this regard, we certainly see Georgia, uh, we certainly see Georgia as an outlier um, in that. And probably mostly because of the decision, more so than anything that any of us have done as outsiders, but the decisions that the Georgian people themselves have taken, um, that this is the direction that they want this country uh, to go. But I think the importance here uh, of support and having broad support of the international community, of the US, of, of uh, the members of the European Union and its member states, you know, collectively and, inter and individually is very important. Um, as the ambassador alluded uh, to, we have, of course, a strategic partnership um, with Georgia. This actually has four areas, so it has security, uh, so, sorry. So, you know, it has. It, if we now, it used to be three. But. It's got. It's got. It's got to be. It's. It's got to be bigger, right? So it. So it has. So it has security. To, <laughs> uh, security, democracy, and governance, uh, economics, and then uh, kind of a catch-all that we call people to people. And so this is where we. Uh, this is where we sort of throw in those things like health and, uh, uh, you know, media and things that we don't necessarily can't put in in one basket. But um, so that helps uh, that helps us structure our uh, our support uh, to Georgia. This was established shortly after the the 2008 uh, war. Uh, the individual working groups meet uh, at least uh, at least once a year. We try to alternate between between Tbilisi uh, and Washington. And then there's also a plenary uh, meeting uh, of this, which we generally try to conduct at a, at a higher level. The last time it met, uh, Secretary Kerry. Uh, shared it along with the, the Prime Minister um, of Georgia. We've also, of course, put a lot of uh, a lot of assistance uh, money into in, into Georgia and into into governance, into democracy. Uh, just over the last five years, the U.S. has put in some 450 million dollars uh, into Georgia, and about 130 million of that uh, mm -hmm. has gone into democracy uh, democracy programs. Um, so it's. Oh, yeah, but it's as I said at the outset. I mean, it's really it's really a function of of Georgia wanting to do this. But the the role of on this the question for this panel, the role of strategic partnership, and one of the benefits here is that we have a we have an alliance with this country. We have a partnership with this country. We've we've committed to to shared goals, and I think it uh, puts us both in a better position to have uh, frank and and candid conversations. Um, and to be able to, you know, call things out as as we do from time to time when we fear that, you know, maybe something's uh, going in a, in, a, in a direction that ultimately won't be helpful uh, to attaining uh, Georgia's goals. So I think we're able to do that uh, with credibility and in, in, in a spirit of, of friendship and, and partnership, um, and and not to be sort of the, uh, you know, the, the the big power trying to, you know, lecture little Georgia as to how it should should run its affairs. Uh, because it's really about supporting a, a sovereign choice. This, of course, um, I mean, the security questions are never very far away from this. And I think that uh, for Georgia and considering the, the regional context, it's obviously crucial um, to have this support. I think it's a stabilizing factor here uh, politically as well. Uh, we're very optimistic uh, for the future and for this year um, that there'll be another round of elections here uh, that we expect will really Consolidate, uh, consolidate this democratic choice that this country has made, and hopefully to to sort of put behind uh, some of the doubts or some of the speculation about you know backsliding and, and, and this kind of thing. I mean, we see this really as a 
as a as an as an irreversible course, but one that needs the full partnership and support uh, of the United States, but also of, of, of friends and allies. So I'll stop there. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Frank. In your opening comments, you referred to democracies perhaps getting fat and happy, and I thought you were actually talking about me for a minute. Uh, every visit here in Georgia, I actually do feel fatter and happier when I'm ready to go home. Um, but um, in, in all seriousness, th this is a very important year for Georgia, for the United States, for the community of democratic nations. And I think it is a time when we need to step up our game, quite frankly where we need to demonstrate to the people of Georgia, to the country, our commitment to you, made not just in 2008 at the Bucharest NATO summit, but certainly there very explicitly with language that tried to offset the disappointment of not getting a map, but in which the NATO communique said that Georgia and Ukraine will become members of NATO. That means that the upcoming uh, NATO summit in Warsaw later this summer, we, NATO, need to figure out a way together with Georgia on how to demonstrate progress, whether MAP is involved or not, and it probably isn't going to be involved. But we have to make sure that eight years from that declaration, we demonstrate NATO's commitment to Georgia, the Western community's commitment to Georgia, and Georgia can also reaffirm its commitment to the Euro-Atlantic community. I, I have great respect for the embassy here, Nicholas and his colleagues, the new uh, US ambassador, who's a good friend of mine and a former colleague in the State Department. Um, I think the embassy has done a tremendous job here. And I think the UK embassy has done a tremendous job under my friend Alex as well, and the other embassies here. I, I will say that I am a little disappointed, though, with how Washington has been approaching the relationship with Georgia. We have a situation in which uh, our president has not yet a single time spoken to or met with the Georgian president. And it should be done not on a political basis, political party or anything, but as the leader of the state of Georgia. And we need to up our game. We need to show not just at the vice presidential level, I admire Vice President Biden's commitment to Ukraine, to Georgia, other countries in the region, but it has to come at the top because that sends the strongest signal of support and solidarity. Um, I, I, the last uh, bilateral uh, meeting, the partnership meeting, was done at the Deputy Secretary of State level. We, we need to up our game there, too, and make sure that the schedules work out so that the Secretary of State conducts these meetings. These, these levels matter. Uh, it's not just important here in Tbilisi. It's also important in other capitals, including the one north of here in Moscow. We are dealing not with a static situation, but one in which the powerful country in the region is trying to pull Georgia away, trying to pull Ukraine away. It views countries in this region that seek to join the Euro-Atlantic community as, as a threat to Russia, as a threat to Putin's grip on power. So we're not dealing in a vacuum here. We're dealing with forces that are trying to pull in the opposite direction, which puts an extra burden on us to demonstrate our commitment. Georgia, in my view, uh, is a key to the vision enunciated by President George H.W. Bush, father of George W. Bush, uh, years ago, 26 years ago, I think, 27 years ago, of a Europe whole and free. This is an important piece of the puzzle with a population that's very pro-Western, pro-American. We should not take that for granted and simply assume that we can sit back and wait for Georgia to come to us. We have to make this a two-way street. So there is going to be uh, a lot of scrutiny about what happens in this country this year with the election. It's an opportunity for Georgia to demonstrate its renewed commitment to the democratic path. And then once it does that, we have the obligation to respond in kind. The NATO summit after the elections to renew our commitment to you, our support to you, that you are in fact a member of the Euro-Atlantic community. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, well, um, thanks to all of you for having us here in Georgia. I had actually not been back to Georgia since uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And um, although sometimes I'm sure living here you think change is incremental or too slow, um, to me it's a dramatic change. Um, and um, so I guess I want to start by saying keep it up. You can go Georgia. Um, 
My uh, task here has been to talk, is supposed to be to talk a little bit more about uh, Russian-Georgian relations. And I have a bit of an affinity for this because I should mention that I'm a, a dual Canadian-American citizen. And um, R Georgia has the same problem Canada has with the United States, I think, which is that uh, you've got a big neighbor, which our, our, uh, the father of our current prime minister, who was once prime minister, Pierre Trudeau, once described uh, the relationship that the United States and Canada has with one another as uh, Canada's uh, like um, a mouse sleeping with an elephant. Every time the elephant rolls over, we get crushed. Um, and it seems to me at, at times that's the situation with Georgia as well, although um, the United States tried to come across the border and grab Canada in 1812. Americans learned the outcome of this war differently, but we won by the Canadian accounting and beat them back across the border, and they have never tried coming back, which is why we've got Donald Trump uh, down in the United States and nothing of the sort in Canada. Um, you did have Ted Cruz born in Canada. You know, and we threw him back. Right. So, right. <laughs> so, um, you, though, have an unstable big neighbor. So far, we do not. Um, um, and you have an, uh, a big neighbor that does not share your values. And of course, Canada's great advantage is that it has a neighbor that shares democratic values. Although Canada has managed to pursue an independent foreign policy, you probably don't notice it at times because we have so few ships. Um, but sometimes we side with the United States, and sometimes we don't. Um, you unfortunately have a, a, um, a, a big neighbor sitting next to you with a great power mentality from the 19th century, um, but without great power resources, but enough resources to threaten you. And it's still able, of course, to wreak havoc on Georgia, on Ukraine, uh, on parts of Moldova. So a question that I've been asked a number of times uh, since I've been here um, is, um, is Russia more dangerous when it's weak or when it's strong? Um, and um, I think it's dangerous in both uh, states, but in different ways. The threat is different uh, in different conditions. In the 1990s, when Russia was weak economically, when it was uh, recovering from the worst uh, recession uh, outside of wartime, um, we worried about it falling apart. We worried about it disintegrating. Remember that? It seems like a long time ago, but it really wasn't. It was really only about 20 years ago. Um, we worried about um, the uh, problem of, of possibly famine 25 years ago in uh, the Russian Federation. Uh, we were sending food aid to Russia 25 years ago. Um, we worried about uh, its geographic disintegration along regional and ethnic lines in the same way as the Soviet Union disintegrated. Um, we worried about a loose nukes problem, that is nuclear weapons falling into the wrong hands because the Russian state was so weak and be had, was becoming so corrupt that it couldn't actually protect and guarantee the safety of its nuclear weapons. Um, and we worried, of course, about the ripple effect of this uh, along all of Russia's borders. And that's another challenge, of course, um, for Russia and for the world is that Russia has so many, many borders. And regardless of its actual economic and military weakness or strength, the scope or the um, geographic um, domain of Russia uh, and the possibility of Russia projecting its power or its problems across all those borders is worrisome. And, and of course, it can affect a lot of other countries, uh, including uh, Georgia, of course. So that was the 90s when we worried about disintegration and we worried about the problem of Russia's weakness and how it would inflict problems on its neighbors as a result. In the 2000s, as Russia became stronger economically from about 2000 and three until about 2009 or 10, actually you could almost say until about a year ago, year and a half ago, uh, we worried about Russia becoming um, so strong and so rich um, and re, um, uh, reconstructing its military um, that it would become uh, a threat in a rather different way uh, to stability in the region than in the 1990s. And I think we have some good evidence of that and certainly Georgia has lived through that. Um, somebody mentioned the occupation of, of um, parts of your country still by Russia. Obviously Ukraine has lived through it, is living through it currently in 2014 and Transnistria in Moldova has lived through it of course. Um, there is, of course, this now, this uh, values rather different from your own, the Putin doctrine, if you will, the, the idea that um, the Russian diaspora, regardless of where it is, must be defended by Russia. And this gives Russia the right to go in and protect Russian speakers wherever they are in the world. We're watching for them in, um, in parts of Brooklyn, New York as well, to come and protect them there. Um, 
But um, as the country has become um, wealthier, it's clearly become less democratic. So getting back to Frank's earlier remarks about the democratic recession in Russia. Um, there was for a time an argument, I think, on behalf of the Putin administration that this was necessary to uh, economic recovery. Um, and the deal implicitly or social compact with the Russian society was that if uh, the economy kept growing and people's real incomes tripled year on year, then they could accept this cutback in uh, freedoms um, and um, uh, a decline in, in the quality of Russia's democracy until eventually it was snuffed out. But that deal is over. Um, the Russian economy is clearly failing. And you may, I'm sure everyone in the room checks oil prices and, and the uh, ruble every day, as I do. Um, but oil prices today came very close to $28 flat. If they didn't, I haven't checked since 6 PM, but um, they may even have, have gone lower. Someone can correct me if they're wrong. The ruble is 79 to the dollar. I was in Russia, I was in Moscow last week. It was 76. I regret everything I bought. I could go back and get a better deal now. Um, but this is a dynamic situation, as someone mentioned earlier. It's not static. Um, and I, um, the Russian economy is not going to recover uh, anytime soon because it, it has become so reliant on hydrocarbons and hydrocarbon prices that were uh, five, six times almost what uh, they are now. So Russia is in danger of becoming threatening, I think, in a different way. First of all, um, it can still be aggressive. The war in Syria, for example, one would think, oh my gosh, this is not the time to start a war in Syria. Your economy is tanking. You've got sanctions against you. You're becoming isolated. You counter sanction. China's not investing as you'd anticipated. Why would you go to Syria? But in fact, Syria is not costing very much yet to the Russian budget. It's an infinitesimal amount of the Russian budget. And it was already included in the military spending effectively um, uh, from uh, the previous year. So that's not costing money yet. Also, people are not hurting in the way that we anticipate they will economically quite yet. So a lot of Russia's troubles are still in prospect. Um, however, um, they are real, and they are not going away. So the question is, what can neighbors do? Uh, should you expect more aggression or less? Well, I don't think you'll necessarily should expect more military aggression. Um, I think that there, there had been a time when Russia was seriously considering going through Mariupol and building a land bridge effectively to Crimea uh, in Ukraine. Sanctions are often uh, a very sloppy weapon in international politics. They usually take a long time to work. But I think the um, fact that the sanctions were so targeted at certain key individuals in the Russian economy means that they have actually been quite effective. And Russia is going to have a very difficult time uh, getting uh, capital on international capital markets uh, at a time when uh, they clearly, clearly unanticipated and out of Mr. Putin's control, um, oil prices dropped so far. So the budget's being hit doubly hard. And I think this is also another reason why uh, we're starting to see um, Minsk agreements start up again uh, over Ukraine. So what should Ukraine, Georgia, uh, other countries, the Baltics that, um, may, uh, that have embraced democratic values uh, do in this time of troubles for Russia? And how will they be affected? So just getting back to some of what Frank said earlier, um, countries should be guided in their foreign policy by values and interests. And Russia is guided by interests, clearly only. Uh, Russia, uh, Georgia has the advantage of being guided by values as well as interests. And um, that should continue. Um, values of democracy, a strong democracy, pluralism, freedom of the media, by open markets, and by good governance. If the uh, state doesn't perform, People can't eat freedom. Um, people people uh, can't eat the right to vote. So it must perform. Um, the future in, if, of Georgia is in the West by choice. Um, it's in the East by geography. But geography is not destiny. And uh, certainly, you can escape uh, the pull of this strong neighbor by sticking to the values that are important. And again, I would point back to Canada, which you may think is an appendage to the United States. And many Americans do but in fact has maintained uh, a lot of uh, independent foreign policy. Islands of democracy and good governance are possible. They exist in other parts of the world. We just saw um, a, an election outcome in Taiwan um, that proves that, I think. We see it in Mongolia, which I think is just a democracy that shouldn't exist, and Frank can talk more about that. Um, and we see it, of course, here in, in Georgia, and we, we hope to see it further consolidated in Ukraine. So I'll stop there. Uh, 
thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is my first visit to Georgia. I promise to say very little compared to everybody else who's highly familiar with the country. Um, my brief experience has been outstanding. Uh, we're teaching here, and uh, it's great. But the question that Frank asked us to think about was uh, to talk about values and partnerships. So partnerships is something I know a lot about. Public-private partnerships, I primarily work with emerging markets and their governments. Most of them are large, some uh, smaller. And in my line of work, key values include trust and credibility. Because the reason to entertain public-private partnerships is in no small part economic. And the question is, can you trust and do you find your partners credible is a key question. The experience in Georgia seems to be that the democracy is successful, uh, people are together, and the country's status has increased over the past 25 years. So that direction works well in my world. And then the question is, if you're going to partner, with whom and for what purpose? So directionally, it seems to me that the economy here could use a lift. And there are a lot of economies now that have been doing well, but have slowed down. So for Georgia, if it considers partnerships, whether it be for trade or economic development or investment here, what would be the view of a partner looking at Georgia? How would Georgia want to prepare based on those views? And what would be Georgia's strategic goals in looking at a structure like a public-private partnership? So I've spent a lot of time in the last year or two in India and China, because we just did a comparative study on their approaches to public-private partnerships. And it's interesting, uh, both countries are substantially driven by the need for additional financing, for innovation, and are struggling to execute programs for their enormous middle classes. And they're looking for trading and manufacturing relationships everywhere. So my question would be tonight for us to think about if Georgia prepares itself to be a better and better economic partner, in which direction would it want to look where people might view Georgia's location as advantageous, its workforce and people advantageous, and the status of its government very advantageous. And Georgia would set up a criteria for selecting partners, as opposed to just competing for capital, in, in terms of which potential partners might be economically durable for Georgia. As we've just heard, Russia has been relatively fast in its cycle. And right now, India is growing. Uh, China is still growing. Uh, and both are hungry uh, for global investment opportunities. So I'd like to stop there because I think you probably have a lot of questions and want to understand how to balance values and economic goals and selection of partners. Thank you very much. So um, I guess before we uh, throw it open uh, to the audience for questions and comments, I wanted to just say a little bit, since this is, um, I guess, my last opportunity to speak to a public audience here in Georgia, um, a little bit of commentary about the state of democracy. Uh, so let me back up a little bit. Uh, I think that one of the big problems in democratic transitions in the former communist world, but not just there, uh, all over uh, Asia, Latin America, other places where countries are trying to build democracy, uh, has been a common failing. Uh, and that failing is uh, a failure to build a modern impersonal state. Uh, Catherine alluded to this that government, democratic governance is not just about uh, uh, combating tyranny, restricting the power of the state, preventing 
uh, bad thing, the government from doing bad things to you. Of course, that's uh, very critical. But democratic governance involves governance. It involves the use of power to do things. Uh, first and foremost, to secure the personal safety of the population, both from external uh, enemies and from internal threats, but also uh, to deliver basic services, education, infrastructure, healthcare, and the like. Uh, and I think that one of the biggest uh, failings of democratic transitions, you know, we share these values of democracy, but the biggest failings in many transitions has been that failure to build that core impersonal uh, state that can actually deliver on the promise of democracy. So after the first election, people relax, and then uh, the state um, uh, disappoints its citizens, and then you go back into a cycle where uh, democracy is displaced by something um, else, and that's really the process we've seen unfold in Ukraine. Now, quite honestly, my interest in Georgia uh, was that this was one democratic, one country transitioning to democracy uh, that seemed to be breaking out of that cycle because uh, the leadership after the Rose Revolution saw that state building uh, building a modern state, a modern impersonal state, an uncorrupt modern state was an important uh, was an important task, uh, and this is something that somehow has escaped, uh, you know, the the attention of of many other would be uh, builders of democratic uh, political systems. But the pitfall that I see, and and I see this coming up in the you know the election, is that you lose sight of this. And in this respect, again, I don't want to be in a position uh, as an American lecturing Georgia because I think the United States is suffering from a version of the same democratic disease, which is to say uh, we have a highly polarized politics in which that political polarization gradually erodes the core of what should be uh, an impersonal state that can actually deliver things and politicizes it, right? Uh, you can see this in American foreign policy. I mean, you know, fighting over the Iran deal and over Benghazi and over a lot of issues that really ought to be, you know, uh, ones of national, where you just consider national interests uh, become thing, uh, issues of partisan uh, contestation. And, you know, Georgia, frankly, is in the danger of uh, returning to that. I mean, it is a polarized a political system right now, and that polarization, uh, I think, has threatened the advances that have been made in creating, you know, that administrative state, that modern state, uh, that I think was a kind of singular achievement of the years uh, following the uh, Rose Revolution. And so, <clears throat> I think that the problem of building a successful democracy, you know, goes well beyond. Uh, simply the sharing of democratic values. It really uh, is this hard slogging work of building institutions. I think that, you know, Georgia's uh, friends on the outside uh, have indeed, play I mean, I'm actually astonished at the amount of money the United States, I'm really glad, I think we've gotten something for our money, so I'm really glad as an American taxpayer that we've, uh, we've done that, including, I guess, uh, US government is paying for our little visit here uh, as we speak, so that, <laughs> that support continues. But uh, I think that, you know, state building is really about capacity building. Uh, and, and what is capacity? It's not, you know, it can be computers and buildings and things like that, but it's fundamentally people. Uh, it's fundamentally people that can operate a government, uh, that can operate it well, that can really deliver services, uh, and that can do it, you know, with a sense of public interest that isn't dragged into this perpetual partisan squabble between parties who are mainly interested in uh, staying in power. So I think that it's, you know, it's an important thing to keep in mind when you talk about democracy building that uh, there are actually these three legs. I mean, this is what I argued in my last book that democracy really has three legs. It has a rule of law leg, it's got a democratic accountability leg, but it's also got uh, a state leg, uh, and you need to keep all of those in some uh, rough kind of a balance. And to the extent that people on the outside, your strategic partners can help in that, uh, I think that that's um, 
that's extremely important. So with that, uh, I think we will open the floor for questions. So if you could identify yourself uh, before you ask your question. So we'll start in the back there. Thank you, Amuka Kudala. As the next diplomat, uh, I think uh, the basic question raised here so far was uh, to answer this dilemma, what should be done with Russia being uh, uh, weak or strong. From 90s, I well remember that um, everything Georgia achieved was when Russia was very weak. And uh, when Russia got strong, uh, we got problems um, with the uh, occupation as well as uh, Ukraine and others. So I would be interested to hear others' views on this question. Um, that's uh, very much related with democracy building as well as uh, security in post-Soviet uh, space as well as in Eastern Europe. I agree. <laughs> I want to uh, say a few words about about how we feel about Georgia. While 25 years of independence, I think we're all here very proud of what we went through, how we went through it, because Georgia is the only state in the world that went three times in war with Russia for this. 25 years, we survived, we still have the land some occupied, but I think we've built a country that uh, now has a potential to become a real full-scale liberal democracy. And I think there's uh, the achievements of previous governments in, uh, with the independence uh, and then going through the transitional period. I think all of them deserve credits and all of them have their own failures. What I do believe that the, in Georgia, the democracy and liberalism can only survive it, if it will be militarized. Because in the current environment, this is exactly the democratic credentials that provoke Russia to be aggressive. It's because they don't like, they don't want to have democratic nation in their borders, because it's a bad example for them. So this is exactly why, actually, by virtue of the democratic transition and credentials that we have, invite Russian aggression. So we need to have certain defensive capabilities that in case of would come to this we will have the ability to defend our country. So I think Georgia ought to do two things. First of course use full advantage of the association agreement with the uh, European Union and the free trade agreement. We hope that we can work also with the United States when they're going to conclude the or free trade agreement with the European Union then we can somehow extend it to a country like Georgia because we have association agreement with Europe. So it's going to be easier, I think, detour to have this kind of free trade possibility with the United States. Second, of course, is, as I mentioned, defense. We defense is a provocative to the neighbors. So this is why I think we have to come to some kind of new state relationship with the United States on security and defense that can allow us to have a certain amount of credible defense that will deter future attacks on home. And the economy. Of course, every bit of direct foreign uh, investment matters for Georgia. I think the embassies, our embassies in your capitals and your embassies in our Tbilisi, has to double up or how to find and attach the investors from your countries to Georgia, how to make them interested in Georgia, and I think this is going to be the key. Fixing the economy is something that will make Georgia's democracy stronger. So I think we have to think more and uh, do more about getting more investors from the US and UK and the other Western countries to come here, see what it is, and how they can be more helpful to invest for themselves and for Georgia's economic strength. Although, just last uh, portion that you mentioned is impersonal institutions. This is crucial, we all understand. Georgia is suffering because of the, today, because of the formal rule, because the perception that people has. Prime Minister was dismissed, he even didn't know this morning that he was dismissed. So this is the problem that we understand, but it can be fixed the next election. So this is, I'm very hopeful, that next election will give us the possibilities that the informal rule will disappear and we're gonna have real 
liberal democracy that we can all be proud of, but without your help, not. Thank you. I am Gian Nodia, political scientist. Uh, so this panel is about values. So and the importance of values in uh, for politics, in politics. Uh, and uh, I think we had many shortcomings in our political process, but uh, we had quite a strong consensus on values and partnerships. They somehow come together in Georgia, that our values are about being, you know, European-style democracy and part of European and Euro-Atlantic community and nations. And, uh, we are sort of confident that at least that consensus is strong. Now we started uh, be a little bit concerned uh, how strong and sustainable this consens internal Georgian consensus is. But my question is to you. Uh, Frank mentioned, you know, somewhat strange or unusual primaries process, and we also looking at this with some mixture of interest and concern. Uh, no, on the Republican side, we have, of course, very unconventional candidate uh, leading uh, quite strongly two months, I think, before, you know, this New Hampshire and uh, everything. And uh, on, the re uh, on the Democratic side, on the Democratic side, it's more kind of traditional. Hillary Clinton is very kind of predictable politician, but there is also Mr. Sanders, who is uh, for the first time open socialist becomes so important. So uh, could any of you somehow give an idea what does it mean? I mean, why it's happening? Is there some values shift within uh, American society going on? What does it signify or uh, how can we interpret this? So frankly, I don't know what's going on. It's, it's uh, very strange. I think most pundits in the United States have been completely taken aback uh, at the fact that uh, Donald Trump and, and Ted Cruz are the two leading Republican candidates or that Bernie Sanders is doing as well. I think that as little as three, four months ago, absolutely nobody would have thought that we'd be where we are today. Uh, so I think anyone that gives you a um, clear, straightforward answer that I know why this is happening is just doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, I would say, uh, just make a couple of observations, that there's a general malaise that is going around many parts of the developed world right now. The United States is not the only country in which you have fringe, what seemed like fringe candidates running on populist anti-immigration platforms that are doing very well. This is going on all over Europe, and it's strange, it's going on most strongly in those parts of Northern Europe that would seem to be the most successful in terms of, you know, uh, being very solid uh, democracies. And uh, I s tend to think that there's probably, you know, a social basis for this. Um, we've gone through these big crises and we've had a lot of stagnation in uh, especially middle class and working class incomes uh, in many parts of the um, you know, developed world, but especially in the United States, uh, where you've got this really great growth of inequality and so much of the growth in GDP over the last 30 years uh, has really not uh, filtered down to um, people that thought that they were the mainstay of American uh, society. Uh, so, you know, uh, in some in some historical periods, this shows up as left-wing populism. Uh, today, it's showing up as right-wing populism. Uh, but I do think that there probably is some, you know, social um, uh, explanation. And I also think that the anti-elitism, it's not entirely undeserved. You know, if you look at what the elites have done in both the United States and in Europe, they've screwed up in terms of economic policy. Both regions have gone through really major uh, financial crises due to policy mistakes uh, taken by those elites. And so uh, there is you know, there is a certain matter of accountability or chickens coming home to roost or, or uh, whatnot. So if anyone else would like to take a crack at that, they're, <laughs> they're welcome to. I'll just say, well said. Uh, American diplomats are not really supposed to wade into domestic domestic <laughs> politics, but I think you hit hit it right on right on the head. Okay.
let's, uh, yes, in the middle here. Kachitadze, uh, International Plexi University, about uh, the Russia again. Uh, my point of view is that uh, Russia is less uh, danger when it's uh, weaker. If we uh, take into consideration, for example, the reality is the 20th century, then after the civil war in Russia in 1920, on the share of Russia, Soviet Russia was coming only 3% of the world industrial output. Before the World War II, 10% uh, under the Stalinist regime. And uh, during this period, the USSR implemented integration against Baltic states, Rome part of Romania was occupied, Poland, etc., etc. And in the 80s, again, uh, uh, because of uh, the strong policy of the Reagan administration, uh, agreement, for example, between USA and Saudi Arabia, the prices on oil were uh, down despite the war between Iran and Iraq. And uh, because of this, within the period from 1985 19 the budget deficit of USSR increased for about five times. Because of this, the Soviet Empire agreed with the role of troops from Afghanistan, uh, Eastern Europe, unification of Germany, etc. Et et in the beginning of the uh, 90s, again, Kozirev Doctrine, which uh, agreed on the dominant position of USA in the world. And after the increasing the prices on oil, again, Russia became stronger. And before the implementation of the military aggression against uh, Georgia, we know that uh, one barrel of oil was uh, cost 147 uh, US uh, dollars. And in my point of view, uh, I think that Western democratic society should uh, continue the sanctions and uh, despite the, and the decreasing the prices of, on the oil, I think it's uh, not enough because uh, Russia has other reserves. It's a gas, and uh, uh, each year Russia exports more than 150 billion cubic meters of natural gas to Europe and uh, gains a profit about 400 uh, uh, billion euros. So in my point of view, okay. at the same time, this energy policy okay. so should uh, play the decisive right, thank you. role. Salam is Hamid Ishvili. Um, I'm uh, representing Center for Strategic Communication and Democracy, and I'm former Georgian ambassador to the European Union. I have a question for David because you know you don't represent the government, so you can speak more freely. You were talking about the lack of attention from the U.S. administration or current U.S. administration to our country, and of course, if you look at the history of the U.S.-Georgia relations, Georgia kind of received disproportionately large amount of attention, even during Shevardnadze's administration, when our country was an important part of the kind of energy strategy. Then under Bush administration, this was part of the freedom agenda. And you know, post-Rose Revolution years, we positioned ourselves as successful reformers in the region. So in today's reality, um, quite honestly speaking, um, how much do you think is the fault of the U.S. administration that sort of you know, the situation has changed and Georgia is really not on a radar that much in Washington? And how much is the problem that we simply do not have right now? We are not in a position where we can project ourselves as a country that should be given you know, interest. How would you project Georgia today in Washington to gain more attention uh, because I clearly see that you know, we are kind of disappearing from the radar both in the US and in Europe. And I have also a question regarding the partnerships and the economic growth because uh, of course the, uh, the elephant in the room in our country is the informal rule. And I remember a Georgian businessman who is a good friend of mine who was telling me that uh, attracting economic growth and uh, potential important economic partnerships would be easier if this country is administered by an oligarch because the businessman would know that they just have to cut a deal with an oligarch and you know they get all the business opportunities in the country. Is that really true? Do you see today Georgia with its formal rule as the place which can build important partnerships with anyone, either on a political front or, or on an economic one? And uh, until this changes, what are the prospects of this country? to change the sad reality that we really face today. Thank you. You want to respond? Um, I, I worked in the State Department in all eight years of the George W. Bush administration. And while I wasn't directly dealing with relations with Georgia, I saw them fairly close up. Uh, I would say that the Bush administration was um, guilty, if you can say, uh, of over-personalizing the relationship between President Bush and President Saakashvili. 
The problem with the current administration is there is no personal relationship at the highest level at all. We need to find a happy medium between the two where it actually is a depersonalized relationship and it's a relationship between the two countries but reflected at the highest levels. And uh, I think part of the approach from the start of the Obama administration with the reset policy toward Russia is, uh, and, and I say this as a, a quite an outspoken critic of the reset policy, I can identify what policy toward Russia has been in the Obama administration. I could not tell you what policy has been toward the other countries in the region, in part because I think the U.S. decided to let the Europeans deal with Georgia and Ukraine and Moldova in particular, less so Belarus, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. I think that's a mistake. I think the United States has to have a policy for all the countries in the region. Putin invaded Georgia in 2008 in the last year of the Bush administration because he thought George Bush was on his way out. He thought Bush was a lame duck, weakened president by the eighth year of his presidency. I tend to think that he has viewed Obama as weak throughout the years. So I actually worry what Putin might do in Obama's eighth year as president. I hope there'll be a change for the better, whether Republican or Democrat in 2017, um, because there needs to be a more visible presence here to bolster the efforts of the embassy. Okay. So can I just pick yes, up please. on it? So, um, I mean, Bush was on his way out in 2008, um, and obviously Obama is too, but you know, the sanctions regime that, that the Obama administration, okay, so I'm a Democrat, you'll figure this out. Um, the sanctions, a Canadian Democrat, right? Um, so the sanctions regime that the Obama administration has imposed with our European allies, let me say again, with our European allies, and nobody thought that would happen. Those are the strongest sanctions that have been imposed on Russia by any American president ever, period. And they worked. They are working. I mean, more of Ukraine would be gone uh, if those sanctions hadn't been imposed. And I would submit also that Grislov would not be down renegotiating um, Minsk now. So not to say that we're going to get Crimea back with those, but I think they were actually quite, quite effective. Um, not to defend the Obama administration, but I can tell you what the policy was in the Baltics. It was very clearly that NATO will come to the defense of the Baltics. Um, I think that that is a very credible threat. And uh, Ukraine is not a member of NATO. Georgia, as you, I'm sure you're painfully aware, is not a member of NATO. It makes a huge difference. Um, they can mess with Estonia, the Russians, but I don't think they're going to send troops in and occupy part of their territory, because that is Article 5 commitment is a credible threat. Um, and that is our policy. I think the policy in Ukraine has been that we won't supply arms. And getting to your question, should, should Georgia militarize? No, you can never win. What's the point? A lot of Georgians will die. The Russian army can be crushed by NATO and by the United States, but it's not going to be crushed by Georgian troops or Ukrainian troops alone. So I think that would be folly. Ideally, you would get membership in NATO and have exactly the same protection that the, the Baltic republics enjoy now. So I, I would say that's not, it's not a good reason um, to militarize, but perhaps to show that you're willing to be good partners in NATO, and I believe that's your policy now. With respect to um, your comment about Russia being um, less dangerous when it's weak than when it's economically strong, and, and the first question, my point was actually it's dangerous in a different way when it's economically weak. The danger of, of collapse, um, the danger of the weakness of its economy spreading to your economy. My understanding is that the, your currency is also uh, becoming devalued um, as the Russian currency becomes devalued. Obviously, its market's going to shrink. Um, and so the demand for Georgian products might shrink um, as well. Um, so um, from a military perspective, though, and if you think of power as only military and wealth, and I would submit it's far more than that, but if you think of it only as military and wealth, yeah, then yes, of course, when it's wealthier, it can spend more on the military, and so the, the military threat would be heightened. I agree with that. But again, Russia, uh, power is not just wealth and guns. Russia ultimately is a country in decline. And it's very unstable. And that's a big danger for um, Georgia and for all of its neighbors. From a human capital perspective, uh, you know, the average life expectancy of a Russian male is the same as that of a man in Botswana. That's ridiculous. Um, and money is not being put into education and, um, and health infrastructure. So Mr. Putin says he very much admires South Korea as a development model. Well, he's not doing what South Korea did at all, except for the autocracy part. 
Um, so, I mean, I think the danger is you've got a huge unstable neighbor sitting on your border um, that is potentially going to be relatively poor relatively soon. And that's a different set of dangers than running across and grabbing your territory, which is obviously an overt and immediate threat. Yep. Yep. Uh, may I uh, answer? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to, uh, excuse me. 13 miles. The reason that Canada does not have an army is because we can't possibly hope to win. Um, and so what we've done instead is we have this, we have the same values, right? And so, I mean, you should, you should hope that, you know, Russia eventually and the good Russian people, not the Russian government currently, are able to eventually democratize their country because that's ultimately the safety for you. Uh, we're, we're at the end of our time, so let's get comments from uh, Alan and then uh, Nick. Yeah, and, let me, yeah, okay. uh, I'm sorry, uh, everybody. Let me answer your question, okay? Um, there are different forms of strength, and I think economic strength uh, matters a great deal. Right now, Georgia, every single person I've met uh, professionally uh, who knows about this country thinks it would be better off if the economy grew, if the infrastructure improved, if the sources of jobs uh, could be more promising and unemployment would go down. So the question is how, again, to select partners. And if, if Georgia appears unstable internally, yes, the area has been thoroughly addressed, uh, offers all kinds of, of possible uh, scenarios. But if it's unstable internally, and if it's not uh, focused economically in terms of what it wants, what it's prepared to do to get it, how attractive it can be, uh, then I think it, it, it's not going to draw attention. I don't think uh, there's a magic person uh, to appear on the scene, but a stable government, why? Because the investors look at long-term assets and Everyone's been very good at describing short-term cycles right now, very short-term. And right now, having a conversation about long-term assets uh, with some level of the government that can respond to long-term investors is what I would recommend. Okay, so final comments. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to address this issue of U.S. commitment to Georgia because this is, this is something we hear uh, from time to time. And while I certainly agree with, uh, with, with David in terms of the importance of high-level engagement and attention, uh, I would just also ask people to look at actually what the facts are and what the U.S. has been doing. And I think uh, on Georgia, you actually have very broad continuity uh, from the previous administration to this administration uh, in terms of our assistance levels, uh, in terms of our uh, security engagement here, our defense support. Um, these are all activities that are, considering uh, the size of this country, really at an extraordinary level and, again, reflect the partnership that we have. So I think, you know, it's always important to keep in mind the, the I, I, we certainly get the, the, the optics and, the, and that's a big part of, uh, of diplomacy, but it's also important to look at the underlying facts. Um, and the other thing, just in, on that question about Russia, this is another one that we hear a lot. And we certainly believe that, that uh, supporting Georgia's security is an important thing. We're very invested in that. Uh, we continue very intense cooperation and, and deterrence certainly has um, its role. I think though when we talk about democracy and about politics, it's just important uh, that Russia never uh, be allowed to become an excuse for not doing the things, the internal things, the domestic things that will make Georgia stronger. Um, in terms of the government governance and in terms of some uh, some comedy between the, the political forces to have a, a common vision and a common goal for this country because a strong uh, united Georgia is one that's ultimately much more resistant uh, to this Russian pressure which which unfortunately is probably not going away anytime soon that's nice. I get the last word as well as the first word. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Russia issue. Um, and uh, I have to say I subscribe very strongly to a lot of what you said, Irakli. Um, and um, what the UK aim here in Georgia is to build up your resilience to Russian pressure or other pressures. It is not 
by any means an idea that you should be able to defeat Russia, but you, you do need to be more resilient pending a change in Russia's calculation. And um, what our aim is to help sustain you. And security is a broad concept. Of course, you're right. It's not just about military, but I do think professionalizing your armed forces, equipping them, um, having um, clear national security uh, structures, having the ability to counter cyber um, attacks are all um, part and parcel of security. But so, of course, it's obvious is building up your institutions, strengthening your economy, diversifying your partners. I think the uh, new outreach to Asia is a good one with caveats. But diversifying your relationships all increases the cost to Russia of messing with you here. So um, um, we see Georgia's security in a broad concept, not purely military. And what we're all really talking about here, I think Georgia is on the right track. I think, like others have said, you have so much to be proud of with what you've achieved. Sure, you've made mistakes along the way, but you're still here. 25 years on, you are still here. You are still independent. Um, you know, you're, you're on the right track. And what the real challenge is, is how do we change Russia? <laughs> and Russia's calculation of what's in its interest. Okay. And that's another debate altogether, but we should have included a session on that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> David gets the last word. Oh. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> it says that was a good again. note. <laughs> um, just very quickly, um, on I, I agree with Catherine that the sanctions have had an impact. Um, they have been reactive, um, understandably, in cer a certain sense. But I do think the administration has made a terrible mistake in denying Ukraine the means to defend itself by providing lethal military assistance. Ukraine is not asking for US soldiers on the ground. It's asking for the means by which to defend itself. Similarly, I, I would agree with you, Iraqli, that particularly given that your country has been the second largest contributor of forces in Afghanistan, you have already demonstrated the military ability and capacity to contribute to security, not just in your region, but well beyond your borders. And so in recognition of sacrifices that a number of your soldiers have made, I actually do think we have an obligation to help, military, to help uh, your military professionalize it, as, as Alex said. Um, you actually did fairly well in 2008 in uh, shooting down a number of Russian aircraft. Um, and if you were able to do that then with even more outside support, as, as Alex said, it's not to defeat Russia, it's to fend it off until more assistance comes. And if you do want to aspire to join NATO, then you actually do need to demonstrate military wherewithal to do so. So uh, I, I think we do have an obligation uh, to, to help you in that, to help you survive, because one of the things that I think we could all agree on is we don't know where Putin might go next. Um, and as the situation domestically becomes more difficult, I, I wouldn't predict a renewed military conflict with Georgia, but I certainly wouldn't rule out the possibility. Lithuania just renewed conscription. Lithuania, is out, as uh, Catherine rightly pointed out, is a member of NATO. But that's what makes Lithuania and Latvia and, and Estonia more secure. You are in a dangerous gray zone. And to the extent that we can move you from that gray zone toward a clearer safe zone is in everyone's interest. All right, I know that uh, there are I know that there are uh, people that had questions and we're not going to be able to get to them, so I apologize, but I'd like to thank all the panelists. It was a great discussion. I'd like to thank the audience. Uh, so. Yes, thanks very much. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun.